Ottawa. This has been a challenging time for our community throughout the coronavirus pandemic. So much has changed in the way we function, the way we communicate, the way we operate as a city. There are very important decisions to be made at city government about the response to the pandemic and more. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for elected officials to connect directly with their constituents and for you to hear from them. Welcome to Ward Updates, a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with Ottawa City Councillors. We will talk about issues arising from the crisis, issues that directly affect you, your families, and your neighbours. We will share the stories of people throughout the city who have been rising to the occasion under these unusual circumstances. And we'll also talk about other important issues that are on the agenda right now at Ottawa City Hall. My guest today, is Sean Menard, the City Councillor for Ward 17, Capital Ward. Sean, welcome. Hey, good morning, Mark. Thanks for having me. First of all, how are you doing? How is your family doing? Tell me a bit about how you've been adapting to these unusual times. Uh, it's been a whole new world. Uh, I'm not at City Hall office, really. I'm only in there uh, very rarely. I've been working from home. Uh, my partner, Johanna, has been, has been home as well. Uh, with the kids she was always uh, meant to be home with uh, our littlest one hazel uh, but uh, cohen our, our older one he's he's four and a half now uh it has also been home with us so it's been um you know a challenging time uh but really we feel very lucky that that uh, joe was going to be off uh you know with the, the kids in that time she's been working very hard with them um, but for me it's, it's just been non-stop we, we have uh, a, a lot more work that would normally not be taking place because of COVID-19 and uh, people are at home now too. So those challenges have picked up and everyone's seeing their neighborhood and they have lots of uh, issues they want to raise. So we have a lot of extra work on our plate uh, and there was no, you know, been no kind of break uh, at all that you'd normally see. So we've been really going nonstop and it's been necessary uh, to do that sort of thing during this time. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, the city hasn't really slowed down with frontline services, uh, meanwhile, uh, addressing uh, pandemic issues. What are some of those issues that you're hearing about from your constituents? Tell me a bit about the requests that you're hearing uh, related to the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, there, we, we got a lot of requests very early on around, um, you know, our streets and travel and, and how people, uh, wh whether they felt comfortable or not on, on our streets. And so people were requesting a lot more space um, that would traditionally be, a, a, you know, reserved for uh, vehicular traffic. People were walking to get groceries um, or if they were driving to get groceries when they got there, they wanted to make sure that uh, they had the space to, to kind of line up and observe um, physical distancing. So you know, some of the challenges for us has been to try to make changes where we can on uh, our streetscape to allow for that room. So we, we have been doing that. We, we saw some changes to the Bank Street Bridge as a, as a beginning uh, with the outer lanes uh, opened up to, to pedestrians and, and cyclists and people that wanted to get around. And we also did work very heavily with the NCC uh, and Mr. Nussbaum to get the, um, the uh, QED opened up for um, people that wanted to exercise. Our pathways were packed uh, when all this started happening in April, runners and and uh, people that were just wanting to walk uh, really wanted more space. So we, we did work collectively with them to get that done. And in other cases, it's been a challenge. I've been trying to do it uh, more often on, on other areas of Bank Street and uh, of course, balance, balancing that with, uh, you know, um, business needs and what they're telling us. So it, it's been uh, it's been a challenge in some cases to do that as well. Other issues, of course, Brewer uh, Assessment Center is in my ward. Uh, and so uh, that was the first assessment center to open in Ottawa. And so I, I worked with residents uh, to make sure. You know they understood what this what this meant uh we have the closure of our of our rink there as a result and uh people have been more than welcoming of, of having folks come here who want to get tested and i've been working heavily with the ottawa hospital and ottawa public health to make sure that that's been um you know a smooth operation and it has been they've been doing a fantastic job here but there's been other things that that have happened as a as a result maybe one last challenge i'll mention mark just as around uh 
things like libraries and our, our typical services. So the library in my ward, Sunnyside, is still not open um, because of, uh, you know, staffing issues and, and, and COVID and making sure that we've got um, enough library staffed up. But that's certainly an issue for some folks in my ward. And I'm working now with city staff to see if we can open it on a part time basis uh, in the meantime. What are your concerns and observations as we move into a new phase uh, with the fall approaching? Uh, we're going to see people wanting to be indoors a lot more uh, as they gather in cases where they do gather. Uh, kids are going back to school, of course, uh, and other changes are happening. So uh, what, what do you think we need to do as we manage our way through that? We've, we've seen infection rates come down, but also go back up in some cases as things have been reopened. So uh, what are your thoughts on all of that? I, I think it's important to keep being uh, vigilant, certainly, uh, but at the same time, we, we also need to make sure that we're reaching out to our neighbors. And I guess, you know, I've been trying to kind of phone through my contact list because um, people, there's a lot of mental health challenges out there and there's harm that's being caused as a result of us uh, taking the actions that have had to be taken to reduce uh, the spread. And so, um, those harms manifest themselves through through mental health issues predominantly. So I've been really focused on on that and making sure that you know seniors isolation, which is already an issue, uh, particularly in my, in my ward, but other wards as well. Uh, we've been trying to reach out um, to make sure that those opportunities are there. It's been a bit, I think, easier that the it's been summertime. It's been warm. My real concern is it gets cold. We're back inside, as you say, and uh, more isolation tends to occur in the winter and seasonal affective disorder and other other um, you know ailments come up. So you know, my focus is really going to be on uh, trying to make sure that our, our mental health is, is strong and that we're reaching out to our neighbors to uh, to combat some of the harms that are being done as a result of um, the restrictions that have been put in place. Let's talk about transportation uh, for a moment, because I know uh, as as everybody, uh, as some things start to go back to normal, I know not everybody's going to go back to work in a downtown office. Federal public servants, for example, are not. Uh, but we're going to see parents driving their kids to school in many cases because they don't want them on school buses. Uh, we are going to see some people returning to work. Uh, what are your thoughts on on the implications of all of that on traffic, on congestion, and on public transit, since we've seen a dramatic decline in use of public transit. Uh, is, is that going to continue for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I've been seeing it in, in two ways. A lot of people are not in their downtown offices, so the traffic that you normally see coming through Capitol Ward and in through uh, the downtown to get to um, you know, federal offices has not been occurring nearly as much, and so that traffic's been down. Uh, in other cases, traffic's right back where it was before the pandemic in certain neighborhoods. It depends where you are. Certainly in mine, it, it's down. With the return of school and return of work for many people as well come the fall in terms of in-home or at, at um, you know, the office, we're going to see an uptake. So I've been trying to mitigate it by, you know, looking at things like bike racks at Hopewell and our parks. We, we don't have those in place as much as we should right now. So I've been working with Hopewell School, for example, with 860 kids to get more bike racks there. You have to give other options for people to get to these places without um, taking their, their car or, or taking the bus, which they may not be as, as comfortable with. So it's providing those options, doing the small things and encouraging people to really take active of transportation if they can uh, rather than driving uh, you know their car um, we already see pileups in past years near schools and it's been a dangerous situation in some cases I think that's going to be exasperated a lot of people don't want to be taking the school bus so that that's a challenge in terms of, uh, of transit uh, you know we've got our work cut out for us to make sure people know that uh, we have put in place safety guidelines. There, there is um, better uh, protocols that have put in, put in place there now. I think it is safe to take transit um, and that we, we've got to make sure that people are aware of that and feeling comfortable again to do that. And that that's on us. I, I also think we got to incentivize that sort of thing. We still have very high fares in Ottawa. The LRT still is you know, to be desired in terms of some of the functionality there. So there's some part that we've got to really do to make sure people do feel comfortable and confident getting back on transit or else we will see that congestion pick up and um, it's not going to be pretty in, in the depths of winter. Yeah, let's talk more about what some of the long term implications of that are, because, as you say, you know, it's a tough battle to get people to use public transit in the first place. Uh, and now the, the habit has kind of been taken away from them and there are people who are 
uh, not traveling much, but when they do now, they're using their cars uh, and they may be reluctant to uh, get on public transit in the future for risk of infection. Uh, and, and let's acknowledge uh, uh, that the light rail system has not been a success so far in the first year. Um, so what does all of that add up to in terms of long-term implications? I mean, to me, it means that we need to start um, taking on a new urbanism here in Ottawa. And, and that, that means in suburban, urban and rural areas, uh, different modes of transportation. We, we cannot just simply rely on, um, you know, vehicles to get us everywhere in terms of the, the, the roads we have. It's extremely costly. Uh, and it doesn't make sense for, you know, economic output. Uh, we really need to be thinking about how our streets are organized uh, in order to to adjust to, I think, what will be long term implications. And so that doesn't mean building a bunch of new roads to accommodate what could be an increase uh, in traffic that will just lead to more traffic if we do that. It means reforming our streets. And so we've been seeing this been done around the world. Uh, where uh, we still have traffic going through, but there's a uh, separated segregated bike lane added, uh, or there's expanded sidewalks. We've taken some initiatives just by putting pylons up and saying, this is safe to go here now. When the winter comes, it'll be a bit more challenging, but we've seen cycling pick up. I suspect we'll see more winter cycling as an example and more people walking. So we have to accommodate that in a, in a city such of our, as ours. Um, I, I do, you know, the, the cost that we spend on, on new roads now is, is not really sustainable over the long term because every time we build a new 50 60 million dollar road like in strandherd in barhaven uh we're also increasing our cost of operating it every year and the repairs that need to be done to it so as we expand these roads we're really not doing great for city finances and uh, we need to take care of the roads we have fix the potholes we have and implement new ways of getting around uh, the city that uh, you know scooters have just been implemented as well and though they can be a nuisance for some people on um, either going on the sidewalk or other areas. Um, they have seen a huge uptake. Uh, so it, it's technology like that that I think we also need to be looking at in the long term. Now, speaking of the city's finances, uh, you're being left with a bit of a shortfall, uh, to say the least, because uh, transit ridership has gone down, uh, OC transport revenues are down, uh, there are other shortfalls, other extra costs, those kinds of things. So some of that's going to be covered by provincial and, and federal infusions of money, uh, but the city will be left with a shortfall. Uh, do you believe that means that, uh, that the city should increase taxes beyond what the mayor promised a, a cap of? three uh, percent tax increases I think at this point we, we have to have all options on the table we shouldn't we shouldn't just say uh, we're, we're sticking to this just because we said that uh, you know two, two years ago on a promise that um, you know um, can't necessarily be fulfilled when, when things happen and, and it's not that I, I want to see uh, taxes uh, go up in that way it's that we need to make sure we have a sustainable city with the services that we're offering. And so in this case, we're, in some cases, we're spending a lot more because we need to make sure we're offering, um, you know, physical distancing to folks. We're not taking in funds from community centers, for example. There's a whole bunch of uh, different areas that are affected with our finances. So I don't want to take anything off the table at this point. I don't think we should just be saying that we're going to make a bunch of cuts uh, when those could affect people during this pandemic because we want to keep a, an arbitrary uh, number, uh, you know, focused. Uh, I do think we need to make sure we're, we're um, uh, looking at, at all options at this point. There is some funds coming in from the provincial and federal government. Uh, there certainly should be a look at um, some of the services that, that we're we, we were offering and whether we need to continue with those. And I can tell you, Mark, I, there's a couple projects in my ward that I'm saying, okay, we'll delay those for a year or two so that we don't have that uh, operation or capital investment uh, that would have come this year in order to uh, make sure we're, you know, reducing our, our costs. So, you know, there, there's some, I can name a few projects in my ward that aren't going to be going ahead this year. We're, we're going to delay them. And I said, you know, we all have to chip in and do that. So that's another method of, of making sure we're, we're keeping taxes reasonable, but also uh, adjusting to the new reality we've got. Can you share some examples some of examples, uh, uh, people who have been uh, rising to the occasion in your ward? Uh, throughout the city, we know there have been all kinds of heroic actions by people uh, during this crisis. Uh, maybe just tell me a bit about what you've witnessed. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing I can mention is just the, the people at the COVID uh, assessment center at, at Brewer. 
Uh, I had a chance to go there very early on before it was open and then afterwards visited. They are doing incredible work there. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our nurses in the city are working nonstop. Um, that, is, that includes uh, nurses and doctors uh, and, and folks that are part of that assessment center. So I, I feel very, very uh, lucky and uh, quite frankly, working with people like uh, Kate Eggins there, uh, working uh, you know, on, on city staff, it's our city staff folks uh, like Dan Chenier with, at the Parks Department, who, they have been doing an incredible job working nonstop to keep services up while also serving people that, that are in need. So that COVID assessment center and the people that work there, I think I'm very thankful for them and the close relationship that we have. I, I see every day what they're doing. So um, I think that's, that'd be my number one right now is in terms of just recognizing uh, folks that have stepped up in, during this time. And of course, you know, the, the grocery workers in, in, in my ward as well, every ward, but they, they've been uh, resilient through all of this. And, and who would have thought, right, that, you know, our, our, our grocery clerks would be uh, kind of frontline, uh, you know, necessary mandatory uh, workers at this point, but that's where we're at. And it, it, they've been uh, incredible as well. So every time I'm in there, I, th I thank them. Uh, but certainly that the COVID assessment center, um, they've, they've been uh, very, very, you know, forthright in their mission and uh, have really delivered for uh, residents in Ottawa. And of course, uh, you know, our medical officer of health and everyone at Ottawa Public Health uh, they have been working nonstop. They do take vacation where they were needed because that's healthy. Uh, but they, I got to tell you, I, I've personally seen incredible actions by them to make sure that people are informed and uh, that they've got uh, the right uh, information in front of them to make decisions for their families. All right, switching topics. Uh, I wanted to talk about policing in Ottawa and uh, the discussion that's being held throughout North America uh, as a result of, uh, of some events in the United States in particular, but some revelations in Canada as well. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the discussion around uh, defunding police. What does defunding the police mean to you? Because it's it's become a bit of a politically charged word, uh, that word defund. Does it mean uh, dismantling police departments entirely, or does it mean continuing to have some sort of law enforcement budget, but streaming some of the money away towards social services, like mental health resources and others, uh, things that the police have somehow ended up being tasked with responding to when it might not be uh, the most effective use of their time? Yeah, and so it certainly can mean different things to different people. For me, I, I've been uh, trying to make clear that I support uh, a reallocation of resources. If you want to call it defunding, we call it def defunding uh, towards mental health services to situations where police officers don't want to be there in the first place. Um, or mental health uh, calls where there's other services in other jurisdictions that respond very well to uh, those sorts of requests for, for service. And we need to be looking at programs like CAHOOTS that they have in, in, in Oregon, where you know they've got a frontline mental health team that uh, can respond to calls. They've now taken, I think it's over 17% of calls in that area on from, that would normally go to police. And so, you know, I've been clear, but that that needs to happen. We do need to see a, um, you know, a reallocation. And, and I think it's important to recognize the police budget in Ottawa has been the fastest growing budget over the last two decades. We've seen a tripling uh, of that budget to uh, over 360 million now uh, since 2001. So we've seen it tripled since that time. And I think it, it's it's a healthy conversation to, to pause and say, could we be doing better here? What are the outcomes that we're getting? You know, what kind of oversight do we have over our policing? I've been seeing stories the last three months that I'm shocked at coming out of the media of, uh, you know, certainly individual uh, individuals within the OPS, but um, it's concerning. And, and I'm not seeing a lot of, uh, you know, vigilance, or, you know, actual uh, reform there to say we need better oversight and civilian oversight. And so th those are other challenging conversations that are not just in, they're kind of outside of that defunding conversation, but they're uh, they're related to it. And I, I hope that we can, um, you know, as a city council, uh, the police board and within the province uh, start to really think about um, how we police our communities, what's effective and what's not and uh, value for money. But you're not saying let's get rid of law enforcement entirely. You're saying let's reallocate some of the, the budget for the police service to other uh, resources. Is that right? That's right. 
Yeah, that's right. That's what I've been calling for. Uh, you know, as a, as a first step, we need to be looking at uh, a reallocation of some resources where we know the evidence shows that there's better folks to respond to those in a safer situation and that uh, will better serve those people that are in need at this time, professionals in the, in, in the health community that can better serve those, those individuals. That's, that's uh, as a first step what we need to see here in Ottawa. Can you give us an update on your relationship with the Glebe BIA? Because that this sort of came to a head at a certain point and uh, they wanted to remove you from the board and, and there was some very public discussion about that. So where do things stand now? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on the board. I've been a member of the board since, uh, you know, after I was elected, and that hasn't uh, hasn't changed, despite uh, what I think was a very negative conversation around it and a bizarre, quite bizarre conversation. Um, I think at the end of the day, they were responding to some of my. I'm 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 an advocate for my residents. I I work hard for them, and uh, I did that in two different issues that they took issue with. One was around Lansdowne Park and, and public space there, and uh, the way that the city operates in Lansdowne, which I think is very effective, and they didn't, they didn't, um, they took issue with the way I, I organized there, and I think they also took issue with when I was trying to get more space for people on on Bank Street during during COVID nineteen. We were looking at removing nineteen parking spots uh, on uh, on Bank Street to allow for more distancing and allow for more active transportation. Some of our conversation earlier on today. Mark. So they, they've since reversed that decision uh, that they took as a board. I, I think they took that in camera and I wasn't present at that time, but um, they've reversed that. There was a lot of backlash at the time when, when that happened and it wasn't very clear why that was occurring and not just, uh, even though you may disagree with somebody, sometimes healthy debate and criticism is is welcome on boards and should should take place. So. That's since been reversed. You know, I, I certainly have my view of the way uh, a city should operate. And I think that would help businesses if we could implement some of those ideas. But uh, that's not always the same opinion that's shared with everybody. And so uh, in that in this case, that opinion wasn't shared. So it was I guess it was a bit bizarre. Uh, and I think probably meant to, um, you know, tarnish a reputation more than anything, which which is strange. But that's uh, I think where it was aimed. And at the end of the day, I've, uh, you know, committed to um, uh, working with them directly, as I always have been very, very responsive to any requests they have. I'm committed to re re doing that uh, some more and also uh, working with the board on uh, new collaborative uh, initiatives going forward. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, we have a good relationship uh, moving forward with uh, some ideas we can try out and, uh, you know, work with the businesses in our community, small businesses in particular on Bank Street, who I've been visiting and making sure they've got the support they need. I wanted to ask you uh, to, to give us your perspective on your first couple of years at, at City Hall in the context of, of what we just talked about, because I think there are a couple of ways that people could look at this. One is, as you just described it, that you fight hard on behalf of your constituents, that you have strong opinions, that you, you advocate for things, and so sometimes that might ruffle some feathers or there might be some people uh, uh, who don't agree with you, who, who want to silence you. Uh, another way to look at it might be that uh, that you you need to learn to lick, get along better with other people. Uh, that uh, I think you've been perceived as being a bit of a thorn in the mayor's side at times, and there have been uh, there have been words that have been exchanged on social media. So uh, so, what's your perspective on all of that? How should how should your constituents look at this? Yeah, I mean, they. I think they should look at it in, in what we've accomplished together, right? At the end of the day, we've got results from um, not just accepting what has been a, a status quo for a long time and pushing in some areas where we need to push. And so I think you can look at the, the record that, that we've put together. Uh, my focus on council has really been around three three main areas. One is around accountability, around the LRT and developer influence in particular. The second is around sustainability and, and making sure that, uh, you know, in terms of our environment, street safety, our finances, I'm, I'm a big advocate of around sustainability and then leading a vision towards uh, new urbanism and, and, and community based organizing. That, that's really how I came in in the election and it's what I've been focused on. And so 
we've gotten things done together. Um, you know, we pushed hard on LRT accountability, ended up passing a motion. It was the Watson Menard motion uh, on getting options on the table for moving towards a system that that functions, the release of, you know, previously secret documents and uh, making sure that we have a move towards an options analysis of what if we don't stay in this contract. And so I think we, we're, we're moving uh, in those directions because of a big push that, that had to take place and there was results as a result of it. It's the same with the climate emergency that, that I passed early on in the term we had to push hard for that and i worked with you know uh, chair moffitt of the environment committee uh, as vice chair i worked with him and and other councillors though they may not all agree with it there's a, a need to move towards sustainability in this city and start to adapt to what we know will be a changing climate and i think we accomplished the the goal there and need to see some more uh, you know investment and, and eventually financial savings from that so th that wouldn't have happened without a big push uh, to to take place and then locally in the ward you know uh, for a long time people wanted things like a return of the much more rink and people it wasn't being pushed as hard as it could be i think at the council level so i pushed that hard when i came in and we got that that rank back you know holding a snow clearing forum and pushing hard with all the urban wards to say look we need a, a reevaluation of uh, the maintenance quality standards we've seen that now we're getting those updated um, ensuring that things like street safety around Bronson Avenue we've seen results as a result so I think pushing has its place and constructive criticism is a good thing as long as it doesn't become personal unfortunately it it has become personal in some cases but um, you know, I haven't been a, a wallflower. I've been pushing for change with the status quo, and people will have to evaluate the results that we've been getting uh, here in the ward. Right. And I also know that I have lessons to learn, too, about making sure that, you know, in some cases, being uh, more collaborative and, and less pushy also gets results. And so there, there's been some cases where we've had to, to, to do that, and I, I respect that, that approach as well. So I hope that the results we've achieved do show that there is a necessity sometimes to, uh, to challenge and uh, that councils and boards are better when there is constructive criticism. All right, we uh, we have less than a minute left, but uh, just a quick question for you. And I, and I know it's a big area, but you touched on light rail and accountability. Are you confident that going forward, our light rail system is going to operate effectively? Are we at a point where we can express confidence about that or not? I noticed that they do have the the you know required trains out on the the track now uh, after after the a year uh, of service. Uh, I'm concerned there's going to be winter issues again. I'll just be open and honest with you right. about that. My concern there is that we're not going to have uh, flawless winter service, um, and I think that there still needs to be a look at that full contract. So I'm hoping, uh, and I think from there's been some improvements certainly. Uh, but the the proof will be this winter, and we have to wait to see when that happens. All right. All right. Sean Menard, I really Sean appreciate Menard, your time today. Thank, thank you time very much for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thanks, Mark. Take care. Sean Menard, the City Councillor for Capital Ward, Ward 17. That concludes our Ward update. Thank you for watching.